welcome everyone to Art at Saeed and to the talk tonight. I'm delighted that we have here today Nigel Hall and um, Megan Piper. Um, just to give you a little introduction, um, Megan Piper is a curator who has a focus on um, artists from the 60s and 70s who are being re-evaluated. I think you've also got a particular focus on female artists, um, which is great. Um, she's, um, I think you've had a great impact on the cultural landscape in London, curator of the line, which is London's first contemporary sculpture walk, and it goes from the Queen Elizabeth Park, is that right? Yeah, to yeah. the O2. And we have also Nigel Hall with us today, who is um, one of Britain's leading sculptors. Really delighted to have you here, Nigel. Royal Thank Academician, you. and he has exhibited internationally, so we're really grateful to have him here in Oxford um, with many of his sculptures, and we'll hear more about um, about the work that we have here. Um, Nigel has had a very eminent career and some really important exhibitions that he was part of in the 70s and 80s and in particular um, has had a huge influence as a teacher at Chelsea College of Art and some of our um, other sculptors around today are very much indebted to, to Nigel, um, people like Tony Cragg and Anish Kapoor. So your influence is it's, it's wide and long-lasting, um, a huge, huge influence on our cultural landscape. So thank you so much for coming here today. Um, and we are also going to be talking about Manishé, um, Nigel's late wife, who sadly can't be with us today, but is here in spirit. And it's really lovely to see lots of her family here today. And um, it's wonderful to have her work here and to, to be able to exhibit your work, Nigel, with hers. Um, yeah. It's really significant, and um, thank you so much. And I'll stop talking and let you two take over. Thank you, Lizzie. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. I think if we start the presentation, and at least we give you something to look, to look at. at. <laughs> Apart from us, it's to distract them away from us. Exactly. Um, and the, this evening we thought that um, this would take the form of a conversation, but we're really um, thinking that the conversation can be opened up to the room and it's sort of encouraging of questions. And um, if they're burning and can't wait until after our conversation is over, we're quite happy for people to um, ask questions um, during. Uh, so this evening we're going to sort of um, explore the, the relationship um, between your, yours and Manager's practice. And I thought for um, people that don't know, it would be nice to give a bit of context about how you met. I know you met in 77 at Chelsea. And yeah, 77 in Chelsea. Um, Manager had um, studied interior design prior to um, deciding that the visual arts were what she wanted to do. And she studied, um, did a foundation course at Chelsea. Uh, so it was quite a different department from mine. Um, but I happened to, our paths crossed at Chelsea School of Art. And um, that was back in 1977. And um, we had nearly 40 happy years together. And I had my studio, I still have my studio in South London. And her studio was where we live in Notting Hill. So we. Although we spent a lot of time together, we were apart Part in the day. Part company to work. Yes, yes. And then regroup. In That's the right. And she had a studio upstairs, and uh, we had two floors in Notting Hill. And that worked quite well, because I think we needed space and time, although we had a close relationship. But I thought, I mean, I, uh, I always think, I mean, I'm, we're visual artists, uh, for, I thought it was quite good, rather than just have me and my voice droning on, to have some images. So I put together about 30 works of mine going right back to when I was a student, mm. which is the one you see on the screen, mm. and about the same number of managers, which I think, Lizzie, you compiled really, didn't you? And some of the works of hers are here in the building, and yeah. one or two of mine are shown. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting actually looking here at the, the earliest work that's in your presentation from 65. I think um, the, the sense of kind of... Uh, balance and uh, I mean I think we talked earlier about um, uh, the sort of meditative quality of Manager's work and the kind of balance and equilibrium yeah, yeah. Um, obviously you kind of both 
have dealt with that in very different yeah. ways. I mean, this little piece was quite meditative. It was a figure which seemed to be trance-like and sort of held up in a defying gravity. And out of the corner of its eye or in the peripheral vision was this strange little wandering balloon. Mm. And I think a lot of the... I, I was born in 43, uh, so I wasn't really aware of the war, but I was aware of it through my parents and everybody around. And a lot of those early works were... Um, um, influenced a little bit by what I'd heard about the war. Yeah. Um, but also about the state of sculpture at the time. I mean, the sculpture called Magnet was from 66. And sculpture at that time, although Cara was doing a little bit of moving things off the pedestal, mm. I was interested in fracturing the sculpture into its sort of p potential parts. So there were carpets which were almost like you could walk over them, and then the, an archway you could walk through, mm. and suspended cloud forms. So, you know, those were sort of early works which um, were exploring colour and yeah. space and, the, and, the, and on a reasonable scale, you know, that was about eight or nine feet high. No, I mean, it's interesting looking at this piece and, um, you know, some of the works that are here outside and you talk about the, the kind of framing device of, yeah. of this and being able to kind of see through the sculpture yeah. and, and sort of framing of landscapes. Yeah. And I think it's interesting... Um, you know, thinking about that in relation um, to Manager's work, almost being, a, you know, the sort of unframed framing of a landscape. Yes, but, um, and the... but Manager, um, her work had um, a, a sort of simplicity in the best sense, a mm -hmm. clarity and uh, a meditative quality using fairly monochromatic colours and textures. Mm. Um, and very different, but on the time when we showed together, um, I mean, this exhibition, we are showing together, but not in the same space. No, that's something that's, I think, quite interesting when you're standing sort of within the cloisters and you're looking out yeah, at your work yes. and you have the kind of intimacy of hers and yours in the landscape yeah, and the, the yeah. sort of conversation between the and, two. And, and both of our works came together through landscape. Mm. I mean, I grew up in Gloucestershire and... Um, you know, landscape was an important part of my um, the, the aspect that informed my work at that time, um, and hers was too, because mm. her, her early experience of landscape was very different from mine. Mine was very verdant, Gloucestershire, you know, rolling hills and green, and hers was of a you know Iranian, de Iranian sort of dried out landscape, mm. and, and I, I I was drawn to to deserts after. Graduating from the, 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 the college, I went to America for two years. You went to the Mojave. I, I went to LA, which was close to the Mojave Desert. Uh, just sort of skipping on. This is a little bit about the war. This, it's called Bomb Factory, and it's matchsticks, which are like little flowers, little crocuses, have a delicacy and beauty, but they also have the potential for destruction, yeah. for exploding. And I kind of had this sort of... Um, fancy that you could actually encourage them, like incubate them under lights. Mm. So I made a lot of works on this. Yeah, this is the switch to America. Mm. Um, it was, it's not as abrupt as it seems. There were many works in between. But this was a piece that was... Um, it originated in experience on the Mojave, in the Mojave Desert, a place called Soda Lake, which is a dry lake. And... Um, it's again about eight, eight foot, nine foot high, and it became the um, setting for a dance piece by the choreographer Richard Alston. Yeah, I mean, you're sort of touching on the, I mean, obviously the influence of landscapes on, on both of your on works both, and, yeah. the, um, and thinking about travel yeah. um, uh, being, um, you know, an important. Um, an important element. Um, obviously, Manage was um, born in Iran and then left, I think, when she was 13. She left at 13 to come to study in England, but she did go back on a regular basis until the revolution, and after 79, she didn't go back. And you met in 77. 77. So did, did you ever travel there together? No, I, I really regret that we didn't. And, and I haven't been since, and it's a great regret to me. I'd love to go. I think it's a marvellous country. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. See, and I know that you spent a lot of time together in um, in Switzerland, um, in the Engadine yeah. Valley, and uh, in Solio, and um, I don't know if um, that further on in your um, presentation there are some 
wonderful. I mean, I don't want to make you leap through your whole presentation, but there are some fantastic um, drawings that you've done from um, whilst there. And I think it's interesting um, to sort of think about the kind of figurative element to your... Yes, yes. I mean, I, I mean I, I've always drawn from landscape ever since I was a child. And as my work evolved and became more um, non-representational, mm. I still enjoyed drawing, so I never thought of a good reason to stop. So wherever I go, travel, um, I, I make drawings. Like this notebook. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, a bit like this, which is never far away, but sometimes bigger ones, and do sort of folded panoramic um, pencil and wash drawings. And mm. they, I, I, I make drawings of um, deserts and mountains, and I mean, not just that. The, Elements you might see in the, in in the city could be urban landscapes too, but they all inform what I make, and I feel it's part of what I do. Mm. And um, there was a, t a few years ago, well, I think it was 2011. Um, somebody discovered that, apart from making these rather um, geometric and um, very non-representational sculptures and works on paper, I also did these. I think it was Paul Huxley. Um, yeah. um, he got fascinated by the idea that I was a bit of a sort of schizophrenic character who did two things. <laughs> and one was quite cryptic and hidden. I didn't show my drawings, landscape drawings. And so he came up with the idea of showing them all. Mm. So I had an exhibition in the RA of the Swiss landscapes, the American desert drawings, the Australian mm. travels in Should we Japan. Because we can go back and forwards. Is it worth showing? On of the, those? Yeah, just of the drawings that you've done so people know what we're... Um, this is a, a very big 10-metre piece called Solio. It, um, it was made for, I don't know if anybody remembers, the uh, Goodwood Sculpture Park. It still goes, doesn't mm. it, Goodwood? Mm. And this was made for the opening of Goodwood. Um, but then it was bought by a foundation in Switzerland, and that's where it is there. And it's called Solio, and it's, as I say, about 10 metres long and about 8 metres diameter. Um, and it's set on a steep slope. And the central wedge of the piece is a, is a true vertical. I was, I was interested, actually, to hear that um, the time that you, you spend in Switzerland is generally um, in the winter, where it doesn't look anything like Nothing like, like this. that. I was saying no. I actually enjoy Switzerland in the summer, and it I being know, so rich in lush. It's, it's actually, the good This is our first disagreement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, this, this, this is actually... The, this is actually Solio, which is a, a place, it's a little hill town on the border mm. between uh, Switzerland and going down the Bergel Valley to Italy. And it, in that valley is Stampa, where Giacometti was born, one of my early heroes. And this drawing is looking down on the town and just beyond, beyond the a bell tower that you see there is a is the valley of the Bagel drops right down and then also invisible in this drawing is the, are the crags of the mountains that go up and that fascinated me mm. that um, that location and also a very rolling landscape you know angular mountains and uh, very ungeometric houses sort of rambling but this one vertical feature of the bell tower and that corresponds to the vertical. That's yeah. why this piece is called Solia. Um, also, in we, we Manager and I both used to enjoy walking. We didn't do much skiing, although we went in the winter. We much preferred walking in the in, in the, the snow, cold. in the freezing <laughs> cold, and making drawings like this, which is my favourite mountain in the region called um, Pismania. And I've made well I mean, hundreds of drawings and views on it. I was drawing as an integral, important part of her um, kind of practice, or...? Uh, less so than mine. Um, she made drawings in the landscape, but less sort of um, dedicated, I would say. Um, it, it was pretty arduous doing it in those temperatures, but... And, and oftentimes, <laughs> I, I, they were pencil and wash, and I had a little pot of... And then you put the brush in, and literally it would freeze by the time you hit, <laughs> hit the paper. paper. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't easy, and I was wearing mittens, and you, after about 10 minutes of that, you had enough. So they're pretty it, quick drawings. Yeah, it encourages you to work quickly. It does. Um, the other place we used to go a lot, and st 
uh, it is the south of France, a um, very different landscape, but I, I enjoy the structure of the trees I see down there. Uh, these are um, umbrella pines, parasol pines. And actually, whilst we're, um, whilst we're here and kind of talking about travel um, and thinking about actually the works that um, are here, I think the earliest, um, the earliest sculpture that's um, on display outside um, is uh, titled Around Maloya. Oh, yes. Which yeah, I think yeah. is from 89. <laughs> I think you're probably right. <laughs> Can it's you? around Maloya. Yes, I mean, we, when we first went to the area, there's the town of Maloya, which is the pretty much the last um, town of the Engadine Valley before, before you drop down into this, um, the Begel, which eventually leads to the Italian lakes. Um, and we were walking in that area, and the, the, there are spruce trees and different sorts of firs. I think it's the, the spruce drops twigs, and when they drop in the snow, they make sort of like cavities, like little nests, and I made a lot of drawings of, I mean, very minimal drawings of a twig half buried in white snow. It's not easy to draw and it doesn't give you much for your money, mm. but it resulted in some interesting drawings and also sculptures like the one that's, mm. that's here called um, Around Malaya. Uh, um, I mean, the, obviously the title relates um, very kind of clearly to the, the location, yeah. the inspiration for yeah. it. Um, but obviously, um, we've talked before about the, the importance of titles um, yeah. to your work. Can you...? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I... What have we got here? We've got, in, in the exhibition here, we've got a piece called Square, Square Dance. Square Dance. Which, when you see it, is about, I think, two and a half metres square. It's not... It, it, it was shown um, last year at the Royal Academy uh, Summer Show. Um, so this is its second outing. Um, and square dance, because it consists of different numbers of um, rings set in verticals and horizontals. So a vertical um, is paired with a horizontal, which pairs with a vertical, which pairs with a horizontal. So it goes round the, in, in that yeah. dance sequence, really. Well, you said earlier that the work is um, as, not in particular in relation to this work, but sort of a more general statement about um, the idea of work being light on its feet. Yeah. And I really like yeah. That, yeah. The sort of, um, that idea, and you know, yeah. particularly when you look at this work. Sort of well, that, again, that's something I think both Manager and I shared. I mean, totally different. I mean, these are you know, quite heavy sculptures in steel. Mm. It's in a special steel called Corten. And it, it does seem quite, I hope maybe you agree, it's, it seems quite light. I mean, it, mm. it lifts in, in its sort of visual intent. And her paintings and drawings are quite light in themselves. Mm. They don't, some of them have heavy impasto, some of them less so, but they are very delicate and, mm. and contemplative works. And the nice thing about it was that I'd come back from the studio in the evening and, and we'd have a meal or whatever, and at uh, a certain point in the evening, if, if the day had gone well, she, I, she'd say, I've got something I'd like to show you, and she'd go up to the studio and bring that back, and we'd talk about it, and it was wonderful, that sort of exchange mm -hmm. of the fruits of the day, really. And um, in terms of the um, the way she the way she worked, I think she often worked with um, with the with the um, surface flat on flat. the floor. Exactly. Yeah, and some of the uh, some of the paintings are quite big and impossible almost to get across. Mm -hmm. So we devised between us a scheme where there was a, a, a ladder which she could sit and pour paint on, and it was quite a um, acrobatic operation. No, I can. I mean, you know, the first time I um, I saw the paintings, I mean, the the surface of the intricate surface of them, that's almost kind of you have, conjures up. You know, have so many associations to it, from the sort of veins of leaves yeah. to the the sort of weathered surfaces yes. to deserts. I mean, there's so um, there's so much um, there's so much there, and I'm, it's sort of interesting that. You know, we've just talked about um, you, you titling a work in direct relation to 
a location, but yeah. her works, um, she consistently sort of almost coded, yeah. as it were, and they were, they, there it, wasn't it, that direct. Just numbered, yeah. yeah. Num Occasionally she used um, colours of Persian fruits. Um, can't remember any, did you probably? Give me a Persian fruit, Rosanna. <laughs> yeah. Oh, aubergine. Um. Yes. Yeah, some of these might have been used for, for the color of the, the predominant color of the work. Mm. And that took, but otherwise, um, they were numbered. Mm. My, my sculptures are always named, yeah. but the drawings are all it's numbered. numbered exactly. Yeah. Um, there's another work in the, which way are we going? I mean, this is, this is a, a fairly new sculpture. This was in the summer show, and it's now in a collection in Wimbledon. Uh, it's um, it's called Natural Pearl, um, and uh, well, it, it's a complicated story, but um, oh, no. <laughs> you have to elaborate now. Um, well, uh, or we can move on. Uh, yeah, it's there, there's a medieval poem called um, the Lost Pearl, um, which is worth looking up. Okay. It really is a beautiful poem. And um, yeah, that's all. Okay. Look, check, okay. check it out. Okay, and then we'll do part two of this conversation. Yeah. And we can reflect all right. on it. Yeah, interesting. I mean, now you can see, obviously, with these two works here, side by side, in terms of the relationship with the titles, um, and yeah. then be yours, the kind of the numbering here. And I think with Manages, the C refers to canvas. Canvas, yes. And then, um, yeah. So the number. Sequence in the year followed by the yeah um, yes and I, I, this sequence I was very interested in um, uh, the the power of I mean it's always been in, interesting to me the empty space or spatial mm. interval um, both in visual arts and also in music I mean you get somebody like Miles Davis or a lot of jazz musicians he was particularly spare and was able to sort of stretch notes and make spaces within the music. And that influenced me tremendously when I was a student myself. I mean, just wonderful sense of pulling out and stretching mm. the, the sound. And quite dirty notes. You know, he wasn't a pure, clean trumpeter. They were quite, quite uh, rough and ready sounds and wonderfully full of feeling. And uh, anyway, this, this, this was a part of the experiment of absence and taking things away from the, the charcoal ground. All, every drawing I think I've made, apart from the landscape ones, I've used charcoal. Um, charcoal and the charcoal dust, mm. and several coats of it with fixative in between. And I always um, rough out the form in pencil yeah. until I get it placed on the page as I it, want it. It's interesting actually you're talking about the charcoal dust, because um, you know, with um, some of Manager's work, you have this sort of haze, um, you, know, but, you know, almost like the haze that you get off the, off, off the edge of the sea. And we, you know, yeah. I think, um, you know, uh, thinking about the sort of influences on her work and, um, and Chinese painting. And Chinese that, painting, that's exactly. That's interesting thinking. Where, the, where mountains are partially uh, hidden in mist. Mm. She loved that, where there was an, an absence yeah. and that very close reflection in mind. And also, she was very keen, as I am, on Oriental ceramics. Yeah. I, I, for different reasons. For, for <laughs> different reasons. I mean, I, I like the glaze, but she was particularly interested in the glaze on Korean, mm. Chinese, and Japanese to some extent. But we're both, I think, particularly keen on Korean ceramic. I, I, I'm more interested in the form. I mean, I love the sort of sensuality of the form of yeah. c ceramics. And I, I've got a few at home of different periods, you know, of Oriental and also few Greek things. But I like the, as I like the hills of Gloucestershire, that sort of rather sensual form of, mm. of hills and, you know, relate to the female form, which I'm fond of. Uh, and ceramics too. Yeah. They're all part of one's repertoire, really. And did she, did she ever work with ceramics or just... No. no. No, I think she would have liked to do so, but didn't. 
You touched also, um, I mean, you briefly mentioned kind of music and uh, the early influence on you, and I think yeah. that, um, it's something that Manager would Yes, do. Manager would always have music on when she was working, and mm. she'd, she, w she wasn't a um, naturally talented musician, but she went to Morley College to mm. sing and learn to play instruments, and, uh, you know, there was always a constant um, music in the house. And it was like mine, mine incredibly eclectic music from rock to jazz to classical music. You know. And am I right that she particularly the cello? She particularly loved the cello. And um, yeah, um, I've set up a, a, a very a modest um, foundation for, a, award, not a foundation, an award for uh, students of cello at the Royal Academy of Music, which started this year is to fund a student through two years of the course in her name and my name, which I think she'd be very pleased about. Mm, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, this, this piece refers to a, a place we both like to go up in the mountains. It's called Hidden Valley. And it now it's a, a, quite a big wood wall piece. Um, it's in the collection of the uh, Kunsthalle Mannheim in Germany. And um, what, for, what for you determines the, the material that you're working in? What, why? Um, what well, I, you're to? right. I've worked in a lot of different materials, from you know clay to fiberglass to aluminium, steel. Um, the particular forms of, of this piece, where they're conical and elliptical, mm. I can make them in my studio. If they're made in steel, I, I have a team who make them in steel. But um, and also, I do like the nature of wood, the birch ply. It's got, a, it's got a grain which I like, which relates also to the, uh, the drawings. Why I like charcoal, I think, is because it's, it's messy. And I'm an incredibly unmessy person. Yeah. It drives me to distraction that I'm, 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 I like kind of clarity and cleanness of form. Yeah. So the drawings suit me very well, because if I, you know, the, the works are, um, um, the, the drawings are um, able to, the, the, the sort of clarity of them can exist in a rather sort of messy and dirty environment. Yeah, so it gives you a release for that. Re released, <laughs> yes. It really, and, they, and they can embed themselves in something. If you imagine them on a clear white ground, they'd be really unbearable. Yeah, no. You don't have to agree quite so fast. <laughs> 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 but you're right. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll let you. This is a two meter high wall piece which was made about, well, it's got a date on it, I expect, but I can't read it. No, it doesn't. That doesn't. Well, anyway, it's about two years ago. And it was made particularly for the first show I did after Manager died, and it was called One Plus One Equals One. And uh, I like it. And it's in, it's in wood. It's in wood, yeah. And it's self explanatory, really. You know, two parts make one. It's like, that's a teamwork, you know. And this is similar, really, although this is much older. But it's yeah, got the same, timing. it's got the same, yeah, a lot of my pieces have dialogues. Mm. And I, I, I find that um, a diptych or a, a dialogue between forms or states of being or complementary uh, uh, states of, of being are interesting to me. Mm. Especially when there's an equation, as there is in... Well, I'm pointing that way. Sorry, folks, it's that way. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I was thinking that actually um, to take us through um, yeah. to the earliest work, yeah. that, cause we've, um, which actually now is behind you, which you can't, um, you can't see. Um, for, for, oh, yeah. Um, well, this is a triptych. It is. Yeah. And she was interested in, in, in putting together elements which contrasted with each other, or, or almost merged, like this one. Mm. So one form nearly meets, the grain yeah. nearly meets, uh, but the, the, the differentiation is clear. I'm actually going to take people to look at these um, slightly earlier pieces as well. Which yeah. Today was actually the first time I, um, the first time I saw them, and it was interesting that I mean they have 
um, such as kind of sculptural quality to them um, in subways yeah. um, and the way the, the surface is built up. And I think that um, I imagine between these earlier works and, um, and the later works, the, her, in terms of her process, was um, about the kind of building up um, of layers and yes. relationship. Yeah, a very patient process. Yeah. It took a long time because you had often to let one dry before the next one went on. And it was a very delicate process. Not so much this one, but in the later ones, where there was strong texture. Yeah. Um, it became almost sculptural, because the, the sort of more solid textural um, groundwork mm. was then poured, or uh, <coughs> more liquid paint was poured into it, and it ran almost like a river running yeah. through the valleys. And it would stop where it would stop. There was quite a lot of control over it, but not total. No. But it became a sort of like a sculptural experience. Yeah, no, interesting to think about that in relation um, to the uh, Maloya piece that's here, in terms of it, yeah. um, its impression in the snow. Yes, yeah. Um, and the way that sort of, uh, objects and, um, yeah. and the like, uh, and, and water moves across the surface. Yes. And the, um, and the, the impression that that, that that makes. Yes, and and we used to go a lot to the to the south of France to to by the water and the the, the water the sea in in the, in the southern Mediterranean has got a quality which is quite particular and quite sort of oily and takes light in a particular way, and a lot of her work was <coughs> affected very much by that. Mm. And you mentioned just oily. I think she worked in both oil and acrylic. And she was kind did. Of interested in the sort of viscosity of the yeah. different. Um... I think there was quite a practical reason for that. The um, most of her work was done in oil paint, mm. but the fumes of the oil paint became quite uh, mm -hmm. obtrusive. Yeah, intoxicated. And she had to find a way to change her technique, and therefore mm. she went to acrylic, and mastered that in the end. Or that was quite a struggle to move from one uh, medium to another. And how do you think um, the, the, the way the two of you work, the, the sort of you influenced each other's practice or not to what, <laughs> what extent? It's how, hard how to say. I think, I think she influenced me a lot in terms of um, attitudes and states of mind mm -hmm. because she was a much calmer person than I was. So that kind of, that helped me a great deal. And to be less in a hurry, uh, you know, rather yeah. than in terms of direct um, artistic practice. Mm. It's more to do with one's um, demeanor and how one conducted one's life. And to have that sort of awareness and yeah. mindful. And probably I influenced her in the sense that I was able to, to complete things. I think she found it very difficult to complete a work. I think that's something I remember when I was a student. To get to the end of a work, it's very difficult to know where it stops yeah. and how to reach that point. Yeah, and how to know, yeah, well, when is something completed? Yeah, and how, yeah, yeah. And the journey, yes. when, when is it, when have you reached your destination? And I kind of got to the point where I could, how? I, I could do that, and it, it, it helped her, I think. But we, you know, we shared many common interests, you know, as I say, in ceramics and travel and, Eastern philosophy and things like that. And I think um, there are a number of exhibitions that you uh, that you uh, had together um, in her lifetime. In, in, I think in Sweden and Sweden, um, Japan, and in Korea. Although we we both showed in Korea at the same time. I think this was probably about my memory for dates is really poor, but about eight or nine years ago, mm. I, I had an exhibition in Seoul, and another gallery took an interest in her work, and we decided to do the two shows at the same time. And her exhibition was in a traditional Korean house. It was beautiful. Um, modified slightly, modernized in the best way, so that it could show modern art well, but it was still a traditional tiled building with a central courtyard. Mm. And it was a beautiful exhibition. Oh, was it curated to be in a sort of dialogue with the show that you were not not, a, was not at all. It only it was meant to time, so we were both there at the same time. Right, and and the show and the show that you um, had together in Sweden. That that was a small gallery, but that was more um, 
conversation between them. Conversation between the two, yeah. Absolutely, in the same, <coughs> in the same gallery, yeah. yeah. No, it's nice actually um, here, the, the, the works that are in the um, business school's permanent collection are in, actually indoors, so yeah. um, as you kind of have an opportunity to walk around the exhibition, um, it's, I think um, it's interesting to have that, um, that experience of the work almost side by side yes. um, and yeah. you have a diptych and a diptych by Manage on the yeah. same wall being yes. um, slightly separated yeah. so there's a nice conversation between there's a diptych of drawings I think the drawings are five foot by four foot of mine mm. side by side and one is a circular form and one is a, a sort of um, a diagonal they're very minimal drawings but they are they they are diptychs one one work but separated into two frames, and um, um, I made a lot of these circular drawings, which they really started. I haven't got any illustrations of them, but you can see them in the corridor. Um, they started by when I was making the big works like the Solio steel pieces. I would take the get a, the wall of the studio and make a freehand drawing of a circle to get the scale right, yeah. and I became very interested in the way that one could make this circle and freehand. And the relationship with yeah. your, your own scale. With one's own body yeah. size, exactly. Yeah. And I started to do that on paper, so it was a rough circle. It also becomes a self-portrait of sorts because it very much relates to you and the length of your arm. And the yes, <laughs> yes, and also the movement was mm. then. Um, what I did, I, I put a true concentric circle, compass drawn, mm -hmm. on the outside and one on the inside. So the hand-drawn one occupied the zone between the two. Yeah. And the inner, inner, inner area was charcoal. The outer area was usually white acrylic or white gouache. And that was interesting to me, so that every slight body movement mm -hmm. or whatever was accentuated by the true uh, concentric lines around it. Yeah, absolutely. This is the, this is the, just by the way, this is a five meter steel piece that's, uh, it's called slow motion and it's um, outside the Kunsthalle Mannheim. That's actually shown at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. I had a retrospective there in 2008. Early drawing, charcoal drawing. That's, yeah. This this is um, a piece called ha uh, Big River. Uh, it's in it's in the um, it's a pretty much I think it's a ten meter long core ten steel piece in the collection of the uh, Daimler Benz company in in Germany. And does Big River relate to a particular? It, it relates to uh, Han River, which runs through the centre of Seoul. When I, I think it was 1988 at the Seoul Olympics, every country was um, asked to send one sculptor to the Olympics, not to do the long jump or anything, but <laughs> to, something much harder than that. <laughs> I had to make a, make, a work. make a sculpture, yeah. So I went, this isn't the piece, by no. the way, but I made a piece which is still there in the stadium. Um, this is 10 years later. 10 years later, but it's based on the experience. Is it 10 years later? I can't remember, 98, yeah. I did a lot of Han River pieces, and um, it, well, it's not a it's not a portrait of the river in any sense, but it has some of the rhythms. It's a very wide and slow flowing river, and quite fascinating. And um, yeah, interesting seeing that and thinking about the, the kind of rhythms of the um, manager's work and the movement of you know the sense of water in some of them, and yes. the, the kind of ripples and yeah, um, yeah. Those. It's, yeah, and a, and a lot of her work was again body controlled you know yeah. and and dictated by the movement of the arm and the movement of the body like the circle drawings mm. of mine just mind because i haven't actually having having said that i would start this with completely um open to any com uh, questions i actually haven't looked around to see if anyone's got got any so um i don't know how long we've been talking for um so i okay so i mean Shortly, I mean, if anybody, 
does have a question. I wonder whether or not we should give them an opportunity to if ask. They have I'm, any. I'm happily sat here asking you lots. <laughs> um, but if there is anybody here that does have a question, um, I sort of give a, um, an opportunity um, now. And there's a roving mic. Um, there's one here. So should we start here? Hi. Um, I'm particularly interested in what you said about the desert. It's a very simple question. Is what exactly uh, was it about deserts that fired your imagination and wanted to put these kind of beautiful elliptical movements like the dance you, you mentioned? It's interesting, isn't it? Because, like I say, I, I, I'm from born in Gloucestershire, which is as far from desert as you can get. And um, I had, the, I don't know why, but I had this sort of urge to spend time in deserts. I don't know whether it's an English fascination, but when I got the Harkness Fellowship, I decided I would base myself in Los Angeles, which was a big art town and exciting place to be in the, in the, in the it was 67 to 69, because it was also within easy reach of the Mojave and other deserts actually, but the Mojave interested me most. And I suppose it was, what interests me is, is the fact that when you get to the, I, I used to go out to the desert and arrive and think, wonder why I was there, you know, it, was, it wasn't until you'd been there hours, days, that your whole consciousness slowed enough to appreciate fine details and the silence and the spaces. And also, the, the, I mean, it has got incredible beauty. It's a, it's a sort of rocky, scrubby desert. It's not one of the sort of sand dune deserts, although there are aspects of it like that. But um, it was that one experience, I think, that sealed it for me, which was on the Soda Lake, which is a dry lake, which um, I remember walking across, and it was, one was surrounded <laughs> by this great expanse of flat, uh, what used to be dead ocean. And it was ringed by not dramatic mountains, but beautiful in mauve colors. and. And I came across a, a, a rusty pipe sticking out of the ground about this sort of height and about that diameter, which seemed, seemed to have incredible significance, having seen nothing but bits of rock and scrub for a few days. And out of curiosity, I got a stone and dropped it down the pipe, and it sort of ricocheted down. And eventually, I mean, after about, I suppose, a second and a half or two seconds, it hit water and the sound of the water echoed back. And that built up an incredible image in my mind of a, a horizontal bed of water, the verticality of the pipe and the stone dropping, the horizontality of the disc of the, the dry lake. And from that came this piece called Soda Lake. So that piece is composed on the right of a hanging a suspended vertical which makes a plumb line and an ellipse, a true ellipse. It's not a circle seen in perspective, but it is a true ellipse also suspended and a fine aluminum rod. It's all painted black and a figure is just, it would encompass within it. And that seemed, it, it framed nothing, if you know what I mean. It's like a picture frame of nothing except the imagination. And I showed it in uh, a gallery called the Warwick Gallery, which didn't, it was in Pimlico, and the curator was Brian Robertson, who was a wonderful curator who ran the Whitechapel Gallery for many years and introduced England and Britain to the abstract expressionists, Rothko, Barnett Newman, Rauschenberg. Everybody showed at the Whitechapel. It was magnificent. Um, anyway, after the Whitechapel, he ran Warwick Gallery for a while, and I did the first show there. And that piece was exhibited. And as I say, Richard Alston, the choreographer, saw it and asked me if he could do a, make a, a solo piece. Um, and he, I, I, it was wonderful that he wanted to do it. It was a short piece. It still is performed occasionally. It was first performed by Michael Clark. I don't know if you know, anybody knows? Wonderful dancer. Then Mark Baldwin, a few others. It didn't have music. It was just form. And it was beautiful. And it, they made their own um, soda lake. They didn't use one of my, I think the first performance they used that, and then after that they, they toured the piece f for many years, and I think it's still in the repertoire. 
Um, but after that, I went to a lot of deserts and Australian deserts, and they're all different and they're all marvelous. Well, I find them so. And it was funny because I went to um, uh, Israel for a wedding of two folks who are here. Um, and one of the things I really wanted to do, apart from be present at the wedding, which was amazing, Rosie and Elliot, um, I wanted to see the Negev. So we rented a car and drove in the Negev. And one place I wanted to go was a, an old Roman caravansary. It was a ruin. And we drove and drove through very high temperatures and dusty, bump, bumpy roads. And I was getting, I was really enthusiastic. And I said to the manager, isn't this fantastic? And she said, well, Nigel, um, I'm brought up in deserts. <laughs> I've seen quite a lot of them. <laughs> Her enthusiasm was much less than mine, but we eventually found the caravansary, and I think she agreed it was worth the trip. <laughs> well, thank you. That was OK, really, sorry, that was I rambled really on a bit, as usual. Beautiful ideas, thanks. This is my sister-in-law, Huri. Hello, Huri. Thank you. Um, how do you decide about the transition of the materials that you use? And would you go back to what you used to use? Or what, what? I, have, I have moved around a bit more recently, actually. Um, um, I, th I, th I mean, when I was a student, I was making these um, what I will call, call I call hill and cloud pieces. They were almost like portraits of hills, and they needed uh, texture. And, and clay was wonderful. And I love modeling. And I made uh, pieces for the floor, like carpets. And they actually work uh, carpet forms with ripples. And I loved making them so much. I loved using clay. And then I would cast them in plaster and make them in fiberglass. And then there came a point where it wasn't necessary to make these ripples. And it was the most gut-wrenching thing to have to stop using clay. And it was really upsetting, but I got used to it. And I moved into making aluminium pieces. And each stage, you have to sort of way, uh, you know, give up what you enjoy and kill your darlings, as, um, who was it said that? Aurelia will know. Somebody said, kill your darlings. One writer, wasn't it? Anyway, I'll tell you later when I remember. You've obviously spent a lot of time in London, so I wondered if London has features in your work at all or in your creative life, what, what kind of effect that has? Uh, well, London's got everything, as you know. <laughs> it's got um, beauty and culture and dirtiness, and it's got everything. So in a way, yes, it enriches one's life in lots of ways, perhaps not in the most obvious ways. but. Um, I can't imagine living anywhere else, to be honest with you. And I suppose it's what you see in galleries and museums and walking. It's a wonderful town to walk in. I've, I've taken to, or actually I did, I've kind of in a way eased off. I walked along the canals a great deal, which is absolutely fascinating. I mean, you know about that. <laughs> You know about yeah, canals in my particular. I know, I know, <laughs> and it's fantastic. It's a, it's a, like another world. Yeah. And you walk and walk, and then you pop up, and you think, oh, it's a bit like the uh, underground. Yeah. Where? And you come out and say, well, this is where I am, you know. And you go back down along in the canal. It's fantastic. So I suppose, I mean, what that does for my work, I've no idea. But yeah, I draw and things I see, and one draws most unexpected things when I, not London necessarily, but. I remember being in Italy and noticing on the ground the, the um, ins you can't call them manhole covers anymore, can you? They're called inspection covers, aren't they? Um, and the Italian ones are beautifully designed cast objects. And I drew this one, and I drew it. You know, there is a pictorial correct way where the writing is this way up, but I approached it from the other way. But I spent ages drawing this thing in detail. I could have taken a photograph, but I wouldn't remember it as I do now. And then I turned a corner and there was another one. So I spent days in a whole notebook drawing these incredible <laughs> manhole uh, <laughs> inspection covers. <laughs> and um, that's the sort of thing you find in London too. Yeah. Well, 
I think probably everyone wants to see the exhibition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was going to suggest that we could go outside, there are drinks, and then in about 20 minutes or so, Nigel and I will take a tour around the school so you can see the sculpture mm -hmm. and see more of Manashe's work as well. But thank you both very much. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.